So today we're going to talk about discovering hidden things, hidden diamonds, and the title of the message, Revealing the Unknown God. How many of you are interested in discovering things you don't know about God? Now, the Apostle Paul, who uh, just used mightily of God, I, 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 it's hard pressed for me to think of someone who's had a greater impact on the world and on Christianity specifically, other than Jesus, than the Apostle Paul. What a laborer. A guy who went through so much, faced so many obstacles, so much opposition, both from his own countrymen and from all kinds of different scenarios. And yet, man, he was, he was passionate about the things of God. And he just kept pressing on. And the Apostle Paul said in the book of Philippians, it's recorded, Oh, that I may know him. And I'm thinking, good gracious, you don't know him? But he said, oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Uh, So Paul, after all that he did in preaching the gospel on his missionary journeys and raising up churches where their people didn't even know who Jesus, never even heard of Jesus, he says, after all of that, oh, that I may know him, which tells me there's so much more for us to know about God, about Jesus, his grace, his mercy, his love, his plans for our life. And how he can still desire, can and still desires to impact our world. So, uh, a great missionary uh, said this about the Apostle Paul. And I find this so powerful and insightful as he summarizes the spirit of Paul. Oh, that you and I would catch the spirit of Jesus And take that first step to grasp the spirit of the Apostle Paul. This is what the missionary said, David Livingston. He said, I am prepared to go anywhere as long as it's forward. So that's my prayer for you is that when you leave this place today, you say, you know what, there's no backup in me. There's no shut up, no set down. I'm not going to mellow into Christianity. I'm going to go forward because there are a lot of forces and issues in our world where they want us to back down and shut up okay if y'all want to do that just keep it in the four walls of the church don't bring it to the capital don't bring it to the schools don't bring it to the community y'all if y'all going to do that just keep it in the four walls but i'm here to tell you today we have been called to take this to the world and we see that personified if you will by the apostle paul paul and silas luke timothy Uh, sometimes John Mark and others in the entourage, if you will, traveling all over the world. In Acts chapter 17, if you've been with us, if you're paying attention and and, and following us, either live streaming or following us on our Family Church Bryant app, you know we are studying the book of Acts uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We are now in Acts chapter 17. The Apostle Paul is now in Thessalonica. And in Thessalonica... Paul is doing what he always does, and that's preach the gospel. Now, in the preaching of the gospel, Paul always included the essential of the gospel. And that's not just the fact that Jesus died on a cross, because Jesus wasn't the only person to ever die on a cross. He just rose from the dead, and he's still alive today. And Paul always included that in the preaching of the gospel. Why is that important? Because... Paul wrote to church at Corinth, and Paul said to the church of Corinth, there are some who say that Jesus is not risen from the dead, but if Jesus is not risen from the dead, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Then a little bit later, he also says, and if Jesus is not risen from the dead, not only is your faith in vain, you're still in your sins. Paul connects those statements specifically to the resurrection. See, it's not enough for us to simply believe that Jesus came and lived and was a nice guy or a prophet. It's not enough for us simply to believe that he died on the cross. Because if he only died on the cross and did not experience the resurrection power of God, then he's not Messiah. He's not the Christ. So who doesn't like a great mystery? Now, Paul in Thessalonica says he reasoned with them for three Sabbaths in the synagogue 
He reasoned from the scriptures. Everybody say scriptures. Now, in the old days, I would have my leather-bound Bible, which I've got. I don't even know how many of them I have. But now I have not a Bible. In this electronic device, I have uh, access to probably 30 or 35 translations of the Bible. I also have the Strong's Concordance. And those of you who have studied the Bible very long, you know there's the Strong Concordance. You can look up any word in the Bible in the Strong's, any word. And then in the, in the uh, subsequent part of it is the definition of the Hebrew and in the Greek, oftentimes even the Aramaic. On my electronic device, I have the Strong's Concordance. Some of you that are strong study the Strong's Concordance. And those of you that are young, like myself, we use the Young's Concordance. And we, we dig deep. Our responsibility is not to adapt the Bible uh, in a way that we like it uh, and change it. What the Bible, the Word of God's designed to do is to change us. So everywhere Paul went, he opened the Scriptures. He opened the Word of God. And he reasoned from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Jesus Christ had to suffer down the cross and rise again from the dead, quoting, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. The word Christ, most of us as Christians, we know him as Jesus Christ. He was known in his day as Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the word Christ means anointed one, or some translations will say Jesus Messiah. So we say it like this, Jesus the anointed one, the Messiah, the burden-lifting, yoke-destroying Son of the living God. So everywhere Paul went, he preached Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, and that he not only was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and died on a cross, but the essential element is that he rose from the dead. Now, so you would think that that would have created a citywide revival. But much like in our day, where Paul preached, there were sometimes those that believed and others who didn't, those that didn't, often like in our own day, were jealous or envious or zealous for other philosophies and attacked what Paul did. And it says in verse number 4, Acts 17, And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. Now, most of you probably realize that back in this day, they did not have the telephone. They did not have the telegraph. So what Paul did is he went and he led women to the Lord. He just did tell a woman. Thank you for your encouragement this morning. But the Jews who were persuaded became envious. They were zealous about other things, so they attacked. And when they did not find Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the roofs of the city. Jason is the home where the guys were staying. And it says, this is, this is the cry against Paul and Silas. Oh, that you and I would have this proclaimed about us. These men have come here and are turning the world upside down. How many of you would like to have the testimony of your co-workers, your neighbors, your acquaintances, those in the community? Oh, I tell you what, they are always going around trying to turn the world right side up. The world's already upside down. What a great testimony to have those who despise you to proclaim that you're turning the world right side up. In this case, they use the terminology upside down. That's pretty awesome when those who despise you proclaim you in their intent being negative, but you taking it as a compliment because that means you're doing something that somebody has taken notice of. And it says Jason had harbored them, and then they tried to get the, to establish the fact that they were proclaiming some other king than Caesar, so they were trying to twist this religious message or this Christian message into a, into a political issue. And so uh, they took Jason, and so the disciples immediately said, you know what, we need to go ahead and get Paul out of here and kind of clear the air before we have a riot. So they sent him down to Berea. Now, any of you like myself, who have some Baptist background, I've never been to a Baptist church that they don't have the Berean class. And because the Bereans 
were, the Bible says, were of a more fair-minded or were of a more noble mind than the Thessalonians because they searched the Scripture daily. Now, how many of you, you've been to Murfreesboro and you went one time, didn't find a diamond, so you never went back? How many of you believe if you went to the Murfreesboro and dug for diamonds every day that the odds would increase you might find a nugget? Same thing happens when you come to this church. If you just keep coming, eventually you might find a nugget. They say even a blind hog will find a nut from every once in a while. I'm the nut. You're not the hog. Go Razorbacks. So keep digging. See, It says the Bereans were of a more noble mind or a more fair mind. They decided that it was important to search the scriptures daily, not weekly, not on occasion when it's raining and you're not out on the boat, but daily. That means every day. We ought to be seeking the Lord every day, spending a little bit of time in his presence, seeking him in his word. Now, you notice it says at least twice now that they search the scriptures. We're living in a society, it seems, and it's infiltrated the church and the mentality of the church that we're looking for charismatic teachers. We're looking for preachers who say things the way we need it to be said because we're all up in our feels. Have you ever heard anybody say, oh, you're all up in your feels? Feelings, nothing more than feelings. And if you don't say things that suit our feelings, we get offended. What I have found, sometimes the scripture, if your heart's not right, can be offensive. And sometimes we look for the preacher who has the sense of humor or says it just in such a way we can receive it. And instead of looking at the scripture and separating the messenger, sometimes we separate the message. So what I love about the Bereans is they search the scriptures daily. Hi, I'm Perry Black right here at Second Chance Youth Ranch TV on Victory Television Network. And I'd like to invite you personally to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. as we look at the need for fostering, adoption, and mentoring. What a great opportunity you have to join us every Thursday night at 11 p.m. right here on Victory Television Network, and I look forward to seeing you. Berea was the fifth city consecutively where Paul and his entourage on their missionary journeys were preaching, and they got great results, and immediately other people out of zealous envy stirred up the crowd. Are you willing to keep preaching? Are you, can, are you willing to live for Jesus when it stirs people up and they respond in a negative fashion? There are some people that are determined to pull you down when you speak up. Keep speaking up. Don't cower down. So they decided that since now they're stirring up this crowd, we need to go ahead and send Paul off to Athens. So off they do. They send Paul and Silas to Athens. As Paul is walking around Athens. Now, I think it's probably been close to 12 years ago now. Jan and I had the privilege to fly to Rome, spent several days in Rome. What a mind-blowing experience seeing all the antiquities and walking through the Vatican, the Sistine Chapel. Uh, What a phenomenal historical thing. And then after a few days, Then we went on down to some areas in Italy. Ultimately, we go to Athens. And there we went up on the hill and we walked around these historic sites. And I can't remember the names. All I remember in junior high and high school, seeing the pictures of these ancient ruins. And we're walking around them in Athens. We had the privilege of getting on a bus with our Greek guide, a wonderful lady, and knew all the kinds of history. She was Greek Orthodox. And we went on down from Athens, and we went down uh, on to a place called uh, Corinth. And there in Corinth, as we walked around the ruins, she shared how the Apostle Paul stood right here where we are and preached the gospel for the first time in the marketplace right here in Corinth. I began to weep. I was surprised that I was moved just being where Paul preached in Corinth. 
never been to Israel and Jerusalem because I know if I go, I would not be able to use Kleenex. They'd all be dirty X. I know I'd need the brawny towels and job squad because I would be blowing snot bubbles the whole time I'm there. Just being where Paul was, I was moved. Well, Paul's walking around Athens seeing this beautiful city 2,000 years before I got there. And it wasn't all ruins at the time. And, I, and he's walking around in this grace, great city of commerce. But while he's walking around, he notices that there are statues, idols of gods. They had gods for everything. And the Bible says that Paul was stirred in his spirit. One translation said he was provoked because there were so many gods. It says that the city was given over to idols. It literally in the original text means they were everywhere. They were immersed in idols. You know, they wanted to get all their bases covered. (laughs) They were so concerned that they were going to leave some God out. They actually, as Paul was walking around, he noticed a idol and there were several of these idols around Athens. And the inscription was to the unknown God. There in Athens, there were the Epicureans. The Epicureans, they were all in their fields. They were moved by feelings. They had, a, they had a primary philosophy of life. I just want to live pleasantly. I want to live peacefully. I don't want to have any discourse that's negative. I don't want to have any pain or loss. or I don't even want to talk about death. I just want to feel good. How many of you know we are currently living in 2022 in a generation that's all in their feel goods? They want to feel good. We want to find a church where we go and we feel good. And the, ple- the music's pleasant. The preacher, like myself, come on, just makes you feel good. You leave and you say, oh, I loved your message. I enjoyed your message. It made me feel good. Now, I'm not against feeling good. I feel good. <laughs> little James Brown. I feel good. I mean, isn't it all right to have feelings? Yes, Jesus had feelings. He wept over Jerusalem. We have feelings. We are a spirit, live in a body. We have a soul. We have feelings. We have emotions. But that should not be the purpose of how we live and why we live. It ought to be for the purpose of God. However, the Bible does say that He quickens and makes alive our mortal bodies. That means that He impacts us physically. We know He transforms our soul. That's our seat of our emotions. So we know we have feelings. But so many times, I've seen in our culture today where churches are in such disarray because the preacher doesn't want to say anything that might in some way make you feel like you might need to change. Or say something about a social situation that's contrary to Scripture because we know people who have made these life choices and it makes us feel bad. These philosophers were there. You had the Epicureans. They wanted to feel good. They didn't want to deal with anything that that didn't make them feel better. They were focused on feelings. Well, then you had the Stoics. The Stoics believed in pantheism. They believed God was in everything. God's in the chair. God's in the tree. God's in the air. God's everywhere. But the Stoics and Epicureans weren't real convinced that God really had any real role to play in our daily living. So Paul's moved by this. But like Paul, who operated and walked in the Spirit of God... And lived in the wisdom of God. He said, oh, they don't know who an unknown God is. I see nothing here declaring Jesus. There's nothing about what I'm seeing that I'm grieved with that glorifies God. So let's seize the opportunity. He quotes two of their own, uh, of their own poets and philosophers. And he said, don't you know your own poet said in him we live and have our being? That we are God's offspring? Building the rapport... Paul then says, so let me proclaim to you this unknown God. 
When they didn't know who to sacrifice to, didn't know who to give praise to, they'd just give them a, a, an idol to the unknown God and say, well, we'll just make sure we're covering all of our bases. We, you and I, must be prepared to encounter the philosophies of our present day culture and the Stoic and Epicurean philosophy were not uniquely to Athens. They're right here in America. A lot of us take for granted because we've been raised in America right here in the buckle of the Bible belt that we know Jesus. Do you know him? Do you really know him? The Apostle Paul, after a life of serving God and preaching the gospel, said, oh, that I may know him. That's still the cry of my heart, and I pray that's the cry of your heart, that you never get to the place you say, yeah, I know God. So Paul moved and stirred in his spirit. He begins to address there in Athens those who would listen. And he encountered the Stoics and the Epicureans. And as he began to preach to them Jesus in verse number 18 and the resurrection, they took him and brought him to Mars Hill saying, may we know this new doctrine? Now to you and me, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the resurrected son of the living God, that's not a new doctrine to us because we've heard it over and over and over. But to them, they'd never even heard about Jesus. They'd never heard about Jesus being risen from the dead. And they said, hey, we want to know more about this new doctrine that you're talking about. For there's some strange things you're bringing to our ears. So we want to know what all these things mean. For all the Athenians and foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to post on social media to... No, I'm, I'm, what's, I, I, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I messed that. Spent their time in nothing else either to tell or to hear some new thing. That's all they did. They had so much idle time, they just sat around wanting to hear the latest, newest thing. Beware of doctrines of men and doctrines of devils. Anyone who comes preaching another gospel, let him be accursed. Anyone who adds to or takes away, let his name be removed from the, of the book of life. I don't need to hear something new. This gospel right here is all I need, and it's what it takes to become brand new. Someone who's never existed before. His name is Jesus. So then Paul stood up in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're very religious. Well, we could say that about America. People who say they're very devout and religious and support the murder of the unborn. Christianity, though many see it as a religion, Christianity is God coming to man so man could spend eternity with God by accepting the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, His death and His blood for our sins. That's Christianity. Paul stands up and he says, guys, I see you're religious, but everywhere I go, I see these inscriptions to these idols, to the unknown God. Let me tell you, who is this unknown God? Who is the unknown God? Paul says, he is the true God and the creator of all. We did not come from the goo to the zoo to you. We were created by God in God's image and God breathed and spoke his word and we became a living soul. God who made the world and everything in it. Verse 24. Who is the unknown God? He's the true God who created all men from one man. Racism is of the devil. Politicians and our society use it to divide us because divided we are easy to defeat and control. And he has made from one blood every nation of men. You got a problem with it? Take it up with the author. And trust me, every one of us will get the opportunity. Amen. Who is the unknown God? He's the true God that's waiting for us to seek Him. The Bible says, Jesus said, seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. But you know what? God doesn't need us 
He loves us. We desperately need Him. He's the true God waiting on us. Now, in Revelations, resurrected Jesus is actually standing at the door talking to the church. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and I'll fellowship with him. Seek and you shall find. God's just waiting on us to seek him. I'd heard all the stories about Jesus, Solomon, David, Samson, all the great historical figures of the Old Testament and many of the New. But I didn't know Jesus. But in 1972, when I sincerely, in one of the most difficult times in my life, when I cried out to God seeking Him, He answered. God's just waiting on us to seek Him. He's not going to make us go to heaven. He's not going to drag us to heaven kicking and screaming. He just says, come unto me, all that are laboring and are heavy laden. Do you seek Him? And Paul says to those there on Mars Hill, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him. Who is the unknown God? He's the true God of forgiveness and justice. Paul told Timothy, Timothy, preach the gospel. Be instant in season and out of season. Timothy, preach the gospel. Because Jesus is coming. He's coming to judge the living and the dead. Paul says, truly these times of ignorance, they're on Mars here. God overlooked our ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising Jesus from the dead. You find any, quote, great religion in the world, their leaders are not risen from the dead. The thing that distinguishes and confirms Jesus as Messiah and this gospel message to be the truth, not a truth, not my truth or your truth, but the truth of God is that when Jesus died and they took him down from the cross and laid him in that tomb, on the third day he rose again, God declaring, this is my beloved son. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. And to quote Jesus, Jesus said, I am the way.